Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce all of you to a woman running for U.S. House, New York's con Congressional District 15. Samalis Lopez. Samalis, how are you? Welcome. I'm, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for making the time to invite me on the show. So um, you're running against a lot of people we know. Uh, okay. Michael Michael Blake. Mm. Um, is Melissa Mark Viverito running for 15th District also? Yes, I believe, I believe so. so. Yes. Yep, Ruben Diaz. Ruben Diaz Sr. Mm -hmm. mm. Ruben Diaz Sr., uh, how many people total are running for this seat in the 15th Congressional District? Right, right. It's about 15 people running for this seat. Wow. Now, uh, Michael Blake has had the seat or no? He's 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 new going for the seat. No. no, so the situation is the following. This Congressional District has been represented by Congress member Jose E. Serrano for the past 30 years. And he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So he's stepping down from the seat. Got it. Um, so there's going to be an election on June 23rd, a Democratic primary, to figure out who's going to be the person that's going to replace him. So um, now, so have can, you? So have hopefully, you worked, the person that gets selected can continue his legacy. Have you worked with Congressman Serrano before? I have. After I graduated college, I was a congressional aide, and I would help out with housing casework and immigration casework. So I have a lot of experience as to the inner workings of a congressional office already. And what exactly is does somebody who holds this seat, what is their responsibility to the 15th district? Well, someone like Congressman Serrano, for instance, he has been prioritizing environmental racism, environmental injustice, and seeking guidance from the movement space on the ground. Because as you all know, the South Bronx has one of the highest rates of asthma, respiratory illnesses in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And it's also known as the poorest congressional district in the, in the entire country. This is, this is a very, very important race. And we need someone in uh, this position who's going to prioritize issues of environmental justice, affordable housing issues. A little bit about me, I grew up in the homeless shelter system. When, you know, I, I was in New York, when my mom came here, when I was about two years old, she was a seamstress. She, that's what she did to make ends meet. And Where did she come from? Fortunately, she's uh, an African Dominican woman. She's from uh, the Wilhe in Barahona. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where she's from. And she met my dad. They got married. They lived in Puerto Rico for a while. They got divorced. And then I came here around this, around two, when I came here to this country around the time that I was two years old. So she was a seamstress and that's what she did for a living. And she worked in sweatshops in Williamsburg to make ends meet. And unfortunately she ended up being a domestic violence survivor. So that's why we ended up in the shelter system mm. to escape what was going on at home. And I always start with those experiences because it's really important to center directly impacted people in everything that we do in community and government because it's those voices that are not included in the political discourse as it relates to shaping policy that impacts people's lives. So those early experiences with things like food scarcity, watching my mom be exploited at work in the sweatshops, you know, witnessing domestic violence, growing up at the homeless shelter system, inspired me to be involved in social justice and community organizing. I ended up dedicating about a decade of my life to the affordable housing field to build housing for people that were coming up in the shelter system and were living in the streets once, like my mom and I once lived in the streets. So it's really important to center those experiences. And now I have this great platform that I'm giving back to the community in this way. And it's not just about me and this campaign, it's about the movement that we built around us. So that's why in our platform, we're fighting for things like universal housing as a human right, universal health care. We're fighting for a Green New Deal, taking guidance from the environmental justice community to help shape what that looks like on the ground. Um, and I'm really proud to say that I'm not taking a dime of real estate developer money, corporate PAC money, pharmaceutical money, unlike some of my main competitors. And that's really important because we have to send working class people 
to Washington and every level of government, we can't afford to send people that are tied to real estate developer interests in a congressional district that's experiencing high levels of gentrification and displacement. Our community is being erased right now mm -hmm. by real estate market forces. So we need to say that the buck stops here and we need to, you know, basically, you know, embrace the politics of transformation. And we need to continue to fight against big money in politics because it has a big corruptive force on our democracy. And we see it at the local level. So the fact that, you know, our campaign is raising money in a way that reflects the values and the real needs of the community is critical um, because the way that you fundraise for your campaign says a lot about what your actual priorities are going to be and how you're going to fight for the community. So, you know, we want to have people in these positions that are going to fight for a working class revolution that's multiracial, not the donors that put them there. Um, um, the, so the, that's basically the essence of our campaign. The the renaming of the South Bronx, which is currently by the real estate developers, Sobro. The Piano District. The Piano District. Love Pianos, bro. Oh. All of these, all of these names. Um, I would love to hear from you. How does a local community who is already uh, working very hard to put food on the table, um, you know, paying their taxes, tax dollars leaving? Uh, the the local grassroots community, um, how is one supposed to believe in a fight against major corporate dollars and these real estate dollars? Because, you know, where I'm sitting today, it feels like on every front there's a fight, uh, especially in New York City for people who want this prime real estate. But I am I can't tell how the fight's going. It doesn't feel like it's going good. It feels Ooh. like it feels like these real estate developers are winning. Uh, it feels like it, the the amount of time and voting time and showing up to city council meetings and you know being involved it requires a lot of time, which is why we have representatives to to show up and do the fight. But how how is it going, and how should the local community feel about the future? Well, I think the community should feel hopeful. I think that one of the main solutions to this crisis is community organizing. So there's a very strong, robust housing movement that's taken a hold of the, um, the entire community, all of New York State. It's called the Housing Justice for All Coalition. And basically that coalition is really like waging a war against real estate uh, developer interests that are entrenched. Um, and in 2018, um, I'm part of that coalition along with many other activists in New York State and we basically organized against entrenched political power, against uh, real estate developer interests. And we said, we need strong pro-tenant laws that will rule in New York State. And because of those efforts and also creating the right political conditions for that housing movement to take hold, we were able to pass the strongest um, pro-tenant rent regulations that New York State has seen in a, genera in a generation. So and those are the ones that just passed, organizing. right? That just passed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was due to organizing um, and the elected officials that were amplifying the housing movement on the ground. So it's really important to have political representation that's, that's willing to be led by a movement um, and by the struggle of everyday Americans, everyday people, everyday people here in the Bronx that are struggling. So the Homes Guarantee platform that we're fighting for in, in our campaign was actually envisioned by directly impacted people who were formerly homeless, um, you know, facing food scarcity and a whole host of other issues that came together to envision a Homes Guarantee, a bold housing policy platform that talks about uh, building 12 million units of social housing and permanent housing and supportive housing over the next decade that talks about a reparations component to address the decades of redlining that many communities in this country and in the Bronx, black and brown communities have experienced because of the financial industry. It talks about taking on the real estate developer industry and saying that we need to target speculative land practices that artificially inflate the cost of rent. And you know what, we have to call out people that are running for office that are taking these contributions because then that doesn't give them the courage to advocate and stand up to this industry the way that you know we need to stand up to these industries. Right. So which which we of your uh, which of your competitors are those people? 
Well, you know, you just have to look at the, you know, financial filings. I'm not going to name any names, but, you know, there are millions. People have been raising millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, uh, you know, from the real estate developer industry, um, uh, you know, and, and that's a problem. And also like raising money from contractors that steal wages from workers and so forth. So we really need to figure out a different way of raising money that is clean, that you uh, looks at the values and the needs of the community. Rosenberg, um, she's not going to fall for your mudslinging tactics. I thought the point. I, I, well, I'm just gonna, <laughs> she said we need to call them out. So I'm like, okay, help no, me so out. Let's, let's call, call them out. Because <laughs> the reality is that not a lot of people even know how to well, look up this let me information. Put it this way: a lot so. of the people that you know, you know, that are running for Michael the seat Blake, are taking that Melissa kind of money. Mark Viverito. I <laughs> so say I mean, so what I will say is, you know, it's really important to support working class champions that are raising money in a clean way that centers the needs of the community. And that is so important. People, champions like AOC, champions like Ilan Omar uh, in Congress, who actually has introduced the Homes for All Act, um, the Homes Guarantee Platform that we've been talking about this morning into Congress. So we need to keep supporting people that have the moral and political courage to talk openly about the systemic issues that we're facing as a society, calling out, you know, oppressive forces that are keeping our communities down, and again, embracing the policies of transformation. So our platform and our campaign is inspired by the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, their history with mutual aid and organizing and political education and meeting people's material needs. So our platform is inspired by the movement elder leaders of the past. And you know, when the South Bronx was burning because the landlords were burning their buildings for insurance money back in the day, it was the community that you know decided to stay in this congressional district in the Bronx to make it what it is today. And our campaign is paying respect to that movement of the past. Um, so, you know, we need to basically like take this advocacy to the next level and stop categorizing the Bronx as the poorest congressional district in the country. This is an amazing community. It's beautiful, it's resilient. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see our campaign video. It's called Red Lines. But we talk a little bit about the campaign and we also talk about the beauty of the South Bronx. Is it on your Twitter? Because I personally, it's on the Twitter and it's on the YouTube. You guys should check it out when you get a chance or show it to the audience. But it basically talks about the campaign and the South Bronx. So I'm personally tired of the South Bronx being left behind and being a stepchild um, in the political discourse. There's a lot of local solutions here that activists have fought for, especially as it relates to housing, community development, environmental justice, that you know the global community needs to start looking to the South Bronx as a policy thought leader so that those sol those solutions that we fought for as a community can be implemented not only at the local level but national and globally. So there's a lot that the South Bronx has to offer to the world. We're the birthplace of hip hop, you know, other cultural movements. So I think that the world needs to start looking to the Bronx for inspiration. Um, and I, if I may, I also want to talk a little bit about our mutual aid efforts because, as you know. Uh, you know, there's many people here in the Bronx and beyond that are suffering because of the COVID-19 crisis. And, you know, I want to give a shout out to, you know, families that are going through this, uh, you know, families that have lost loved ones. It's a real, you know, crisis. Uh, so my heart goes out to everybody facing uh, these issues. So, you know, what we're doing in our campaign is we're using our political infrastructure to phone bank, to check up on our neighbors, to make sure that they're doing okay, that their mental health is, is doing uh, okay. And, you know, for people that are hungry, um, we're, you know, delivering groceries to them um, and things like that. And, uh, you know, in the coronavirus uh, crisis that we're experiencing now, like hunger is probably the top issue that we encounter in the community. So I just wanted to, you know, direct people to lopezforthepeople.com. If you know anybody in need in the community, uh, you know, direct them to that website because we've revamped it to basically include different resources. And we're really trying to like connect with people, um, you know, as part of this effort. And we're very, very proud of that. Uh, and then the other thing that, you know, we also need to talk about is the importance of political representation. Um, for me, you know, running, you know, for the seat um, and being involved in politics and community organizing, it's not about being like, 
the expert in the room, the person that knows everything, right? It's about being intentional about reaching out to marginalized voices that have not had a seat at the table. It's about making sure that everybody has a chance to be heard, to be seen, to be involved in policy making. If you're homeless, if you're going hungry, if you're facing the indignities of the welfare system, you need to be at that table so that you can re-envision with us like what a society can look like on your terms. So one of the things that's important is representation. And I don't know if you if you know, but the governor uh, and you know, uh, Carl Heasty and Andrea uh, Stewart Cousins and others, uh, you know, they've appointed a redistricting commission, which is really critical in terms of shaping, um, you know, political representation and community representation and things like that. Now, so, re by redistricting, and, is that like gerrymandering or is or what are we saying? No, it's basically like drawing the political boundaries, right, to make sure that like, you know, we, we have the political representation that's necessary. So right now, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Latinos that live in uh, New York City, that live in New York State, and about 66% of the community is Latino. And for there not to be any representative, not, for there not to be a woman, number one, and for there not to be, uh, you know, Latino or Latina or Afro-Latina or Afro-Latino on this commission that's going to be really significant in terms of deciding what that representation is going to look like is a problem. So that is what political representation needs to be about. It needs to be based on population. It needs to be based on, you know, um, the number of people that live in the community so that everybody in a community can have a say and have a seat at the table. So that's something that we need to organize around because an injustice to one community is an injustice to all communities. So we, we need to stand um, you know, with all communities to make sure that we're fully counted and represented. And I also wanna encourage people listening to this uh, show to also um, uh, make your voice uh, count applying for the census. Because if we don't uh, count, if we don't apply for the census and submit our application, we're not gonna get the funding in our communities that are due to us. Tell them. And we're not gonna be, you know, so it's really important. Don't worry, we've been doing our we've been doing our part. We've been talking and about it. And I a really lot. appreciate Hot 97 and all the leadership here on this radio show raising awareness because you guys are a really important part of that conversation. Um, I can't lie, Samalis, I, I need I need I need your help too, because I'll be getting tired, bro. I'll be up here every day. Why are you tired? I just get tired, man. I'll be feeling like I'm screaming at brick walls out here, man. You got people still don't vote. You got people don't want to participate in the census. Mm. You got all the conspiracy theories. You got all of this and all of that. And it's like, listen, they take money out your check for taxes. You're, and if you don't get involved in having representation on how that money comes back to your community in a real mm -hmm. way, in a useful way, you're playing yourself. We talk about it all the time. But some mornings I just come up here and I'm tired, man. I'm tired of being the guy that's like the old man screaming on his front lawn like, you That's kids. who you are, though. Yeah. But, you know. Mm. I just get yeah, tired. No, so I appreciate, I appreciate your energy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, and it's not only me. And I started off with my personal story, but my personal story, as you all know, is not unique. There are many people in this congressional district and beyond that are experiencing the same things. So they need that kind of representation that's going to be unapologetic. They need a kind of representation that's going to bring everybody together. You know, the, the African community, the, the Black American community, the, the Afro-Latino community. We all need to come together because our main oppressors are white supremacy, corporate greed, political corruption, big money in politics. And we need to, you know, basically like, you know, what, you know, stage a working class multiracial revolution that's going to center, you know, our working class perspectives in our way of life, in our politics, in our civic discourse. And it's really up to us to take ownership of that process. But I also understand that there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of issues, working two jobs, three jobs to make ends meet. So the onus is really on, you know, political representatives to be the voice of the people and create those spaces for political engagement so that people can be heard. Um, and so that their struggles and their stories with struggle can, you know, be given a platform. And, you know, that's what I plan to do. I mean, I, I uh, lead by listening. I was told this recently and I, you know, really appreciate that. And I think that we need to listen more in our politics 
And I think that we need to continue to create those spaces uh, for people to just come forth and share their stories. And anybody that has a platform, whether it's you all on the show, whether it's people in Congress um, or other levels, we need to humble ourselves and you know, reach to people that are not being involved, that are not in the, in the conversation um, and let them shine and use our platforms to you know, you know, uh, put a spotlight on what they're going through so that we can transform, right? And like take their suffering and transform that into collective action um, through policy that will make an impact in people's life for the better. Because a measure of our society is by how we treat our most vulnerable. That's and right. right now we're not doing that. And I don't know if you guys know, you probably know already, but Governor Cuomo, he's also cut Medicaid as well in yeah. a pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, these are issues that we need to mobilize in our communities and just, you know, continue to organize because that is the number one solution that we have to create change. Um, and political leaders have to be intentional about following the movement space to create, uh, you know, those changes that need to be uh, that need to be had because, uh, you know, change always happens from the ground up. It never happens from the top down. And power does not concede anything. You have to take uh, power, and the way to do that is through organizing, as we saw in the civil rights movement. Um, you know, as we're seeing in many different kinds of social movements throughout the history of this country, we need to continue in that tradition. Um, and once again, take inspiration from movements like the Black Panthers, like the Young Lords, to wage a change that we deserve. Samalise Lopez, uh, she's raised right there in the Bronx, went to school in University Heights, got a degree at Columbia University. Uh, she's part of the local Democrats of New York, so she knows what she's talking about. Um, her key check out messages. Lopez for the people. Yeah, man. Lopez yeah, for the people. Yeah, check out Lopez for the people. Check out Lopez for the people.com. If you want to help us make phone calls, if you want to donate, if you want to, you know, help us check in on our neighbors and deliver groceries to people, uh, check us out at Lopez for the people.com. We're really trying to do something positive. We're trying to do the right thing, but we need support from the community to help us get there. So I'm really counting on you guys. Anybody who's listening, please, please reach out especially if you live in the district, like we're here for you. We want to uh, hear from you um, and incorporate your struggles and your stories into our platform. And, you know, if you've heard about us already, let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we're doing wrong. We want to hear from you. Um, you know, I also want to invite folks to a public benefits session that we're organizing this Friday for people that are having trouble accessing public benefits as part of the corona crisis um, uh, epidemic that we're experiencing. So go to lopezforthepeople.com so you can uh, sign up. And again, you know, give us feedback because we're just as strong as you know, people that are involved and are listening. So join us at lopezforthepeople.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram and all that good stuff. Thank you, Sam Thank pa'lante. you. Pa <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you too. Okay, gracias. All right, take care. Have a great day. Igualmente, bye. Right. Bye-bye. Have a good day.